everybody. We have a very, very interesting chat um, about to unfold for you. It's with a fellow called Greg Barton, who's not only a mechanical engineer and the designer of all epic surf skis and paddles, but Greg was is undoubtedly one of the greatest athletes I've ever raced in my career and certainly in the top three or four people technically that I've ever seen paddle with the current propeller paddles that we all have throughout the world. So. This is a, quite an, an intriguing chat about the man himself and also his visions on a lot of things in the sport of paddling. Uh, well, Greg, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I think uh, the first question that I'd like to ask that I'm sure a lot of the listeners would be interested to, uh, to hear is you have competed in Molokai now a number of times, but primarily when you did your first Molokai, I've heard an interview with you where you said you thought you had been a great sprint paddler and a great marathon paddler and done a lot of fantastic events across the US and uh, you thought the Molokai race would be a little bit of a walk in the park but you uh, got over there and found it to be quite different. Can you explain why that happened? It's a completely different scenario paddling on flat water versus paddling out in the ocean and going over I assumed if I was a fast paddler and had good, good endurance that I could compete with anybody but I quickly found after a couple of sessions with the local Hawaiians that the skill of maximizing the use of the waves is much more important than brute strength in uh, those kind of conditions. Yeah, and you know there had been races that you competed in. I believe the event was called the Finlandia where it went across the U.S. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. There's a Finlandia Clean Water Challenge. It was a one-month event that went from Chicago to New York City, and I raced that one twice. Right, and uh, that has a lot of open water, like lake sections and a fair bit of chop and bump in that as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's, it's a combination because you, you paddle on the Great Lakes, so that gets uh, chop and bumps, but typically not as much as the ocean does. It depends on, on the day, individual day. If you get a really windy day, it'll kick up, but also can be uh, fairly flat. And then there's also some, some river and canal sections in that event. Okay, well, this is the very topic that I think is quite interesting because... Out of all the people that I've ever seen paddle at the Sprint World Championships over a thousand metres or a 10,000 metre race that we used to have, and to see you paddle away from the field in one of those events is unquestionably, um, you know, put you in one of the great paddlers in the flatwater paddlers of the world in your career. So why do you believe if you can paddle across the states and go through all those sections of the Great Lakes where you've got a lot of wind and a lot of side chop? And, you know, sometimes incredibly fatigued, I'm sure, in some of those days over a month of paddling. Why do you find that it's such a challenge for you to actually understand where to be in the runners when it comes to Hawaii? It's really complicated, and there's no substitute for just time in those conditions. And you, you can talk about it, you can draw diagrams, you can say theoretically you should do this or this. But until you actually get out there and you're, you're on a wave, and then you have to decide, okay, am I going to turn right or turn left or stay straight, and, and should I sprint now or let this one go by? Um, it's really a, more of an art than a science. And the, the disadvantage that I have is I simply don't have the time in those conditions that, that you or Oscar or Dean Gardner or some of the other uh, Sersky paddling greats have had. And I, I kind of envy you guys growing up uh, with surf life-saving and out in the ocean uh, all those times uh, whereas I'm lucky to get uh, two or three weeks a year in those types of conditions. Yeah, it, look, it's, it's a great point you make. Um, I'm sure we've all been involved in downwind clinics, either running them or listening to what people like Oscar and so forth have said. And I actually run a downwind clinic myself. And it's certainly the hardest part of education for a paddler if they choose to do open water events because there is nothing that is ever the same. And I completely understand where you're coming from. And what I would like to try and educate um, some of the listeners that are going to be going to Hawaii for the first time and if it blows up and it's over 20 knots with four to six foot eight foot swell it's a very very challenging channel when you're out in the middle and that tends to be the conditions so what would your advice be to a person that is about 16 weeks out from doing their first race in Hawaii what would you suggest from your own point of view that they should be doing okay the first thing I, I would do is, is talk to other people that are good at paddling in the surf and either uh, take a clinic or a class from them, or uh, just find out what they do in those conditions. And then, like I said, you need to convert that knowledge into practical use. And I would spend, in those 16 weeks, as much time in those conditions as possible. If you can get out uh, several times a week 
in uh, good downwind conditions, that will make a huge difference come race day. All right, fantastic. I think uh, a lot of people will benefit from that because that's one thing that I certainly do myself and uh, I'm sure many others, if they get to spend the time and become more comfortable, they'll definitely get more from the conditions, that's for sure. Um, can we just step into a little bit more personal um, questioning for yourself? When did you start paddling? I started paddling when I was 10 years old and my, my very first paddling was in open canoes, which is very popular in uh, North America, two-person open canoes. And then about that same time, I met Marcia Smoke, who had won a bronze medal in the 64 Olympics. And she became a coach for my older brother and myself. And so I started, did my first uh, K1 race at age 10 as well. Okay, fantastic. And what, what about your, was it, was it a family um, sort of sport at that stage in your life? Were your parents heavily involved in being with you in your brother doing it? Uh, yes, it was. My, my parents did this uh, uh, two-person open canoe as they'd raced the mixed class. And so my older brother and myself, my younger sister would tag along and watch. And pretty soon we wanted to get in and paddle as well. So we started. And then when I uh, met Marcia, I thought it was just the coolest thing in the world that she'd won a medal in the Olympics. And that became a goal at a very young age of mine to go to the Olympics and win a medal. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how a lot of Olympic gold medalists start their careers. It comes from such a broad spectrum of interest that um, once paddle sport tends to get into your veins and you love it that much, it's quite hard to, uh, to not do for the rest of your life, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. So um, tell me a little bit more about when you started to become an international athlete. Um, of course, the first time I ever saw you, um, you're certainly not a huge tall person like some of the Scandinavians or like Knut Holman or a lot of people that had been in German canoeing teams. So you were, you were more of that lean build with a fairly strong upper body muscular structure. So when you first became involved in, the, in international canoeing, what is something that you felt like made major steps for you when you started to race internationally just getting out of the States? I, I think the, the, the main thing that I learned was uh, uh, training hard to have good endurance and then being very consistent in your training. And I think it actually helped me. I, when I was growing up, I was uh, quite small for my age. And so at the junior level competitions, I was always racing against guys that were bigger and stronger than me. And I knew the only way I was going to beat them was to be um, better technically and to uh, have better endurance and catch them at the end of the race. So that became my, my style of racing from an early age. And it carried on through my career even after I, I got, uh, grew up and got bigger. And I was still at a slight uh, height and strength disadvantage to some of the competitors I was racing. But uh, the training and uh, just uh, dedication makes, makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, it certainly does. It's irreplaceable, that's for sure. But if there's one thing, I mean, I've raced you a number of times internationally when we were both in the sort of prime times of our career. And, you know, we had some great battles and we certainly raced who I regard to be the greatest K1 paddler that I've ever competed against, which was Knut. He was very successful over a long time. But what would you think technically, because you are very good technically, your rotation's nearly second to nobody, and uh, I believe it's your greatest strength from an outside observer, that's for sure. But what do you believe is the most important technical component above everything else that a person needs to have in their stroke? I think the, the most important thing is, is to connect with your entire body. And that means uh, good body rotation and also connecting in with your legs. And if you look at the top paddlers today in sprint racing, uh, you'll see they're all getting a lot of leg action, and that, that connects right in with their core. And uh, the power is really coming from the core rather than from their arms. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I 100% I agree. Okay, now let's um, um, move on to the epic scenario that has developed over I'm not sure how long exactly it's been going has epic been going for 10 years yet yeah epic has been going now it's coming on uh, 17 years it first started as epic paddles right so Ep epic paddles has been going uh, almost 17 years and then epic right. kayaks has been about 12 years okay and uh, was epic originally started by yourself yeah I started it originally as a paddle company and as I was growing up uh, equipment, uh, elite level equipment wasn't all that readily available and at the time when I was pat first became a senior paddler, most everybody was using wooden paddles and, and I knew that the uh, properties of carbon fiber could make an extremely light and strong paddle so I made, uh, started making my own paddles uh, which I used to win my first three Olympic medals. Ok, 
Okay, fantastic. So um, how did the epic ski journey begin for you? Well, it started, uh, first I had epic paddles, and then I partnered up with Oscar Chalupski, and we decided to form epic kayaks and, and branch out into kayaks as well. And initially, our, our first boats were actually touring kayaks for the North American market. We, we thought that the, the market at that time would be bigger in that type of craft. But after a couple of years, uh, and Oscar and I paddling a number of different skis, we said, you know, I, I think we can make one as good or better than anything that's out there. So we got together and uh, put some, some thought and a lot of time and effort and, and came up with the V10, which was the first epic surf ski. And, uh, you know, even although the V10 now has been superseded by the new V10 that's out, um, I certainly believe one of the greatest downwind races I ever paddled was in that old V10. And there was something, uh, it's quite interesting when you look on the Epic website, it says the legend continues because there is no doubt about in the right conditions that are fairly big and sloppy and bumpy, that ski is a fantastic boat um, still today and I believe would be still every bit as competitive as any of the boats you've made since in those big wild conditions. Yeah, the, the V10 had a lot of new features that, that had, hadn't been commonly used before. It had uh, a single foot well, which allowed you to uh, put your feet close together. That, that dropped your, your heels down lower, which gave you a, a better paddling position, a more powerful paddling position. It also had uh, adjustable foot brace so that uh, you could custom fit the boat to anybody. And when you wanted to sell your ski when you're done, you, you could sell it to somebody that wasn't necessarily the same size and uh, a few of those and at that time the, the trend also the skis were starting to get um, very tippy and difficult to control so we we thought we struck a good balance between uh, stability and speed and maneuverability and there's no doubt about it the uh, the balance was uh, you know quite infectious because while there were other ski manufacturers around the globe um, epic has had a fairly quick rise to what you would say by now is the most dominant selling uh, individual company in the world in, in the sport. So it's had a very quick rise after that V10 was created, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, it's been, uh, uh, as we've over time, we, we've tweaked the designs and we've uh, proved our manufacturing and it's, it's certainly been a lot of hard work and we've had our hiccups along the way, but uh, we're really proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic achievement, there's no doubt about that. So. Let's talk about the surf ski, the ocean ski that's been developed, of course, which is, you know, the ultimate name for all the range that you have being, you know, V6s, V8s, right through to V14s. Um, was it the Molokai ski race that inspired the process to actually begin in the kayak surf ski market for you and Oscar? Yeah, so Oscar, obviously, uh, having won, won that race uh, multiple times, more than anybody else, you know, he, he's always... I think that's got a, he's got a soft place in his heart for that event. And the first surf ski race I ever did was the Molokai race. And a lot of people think about it and dream about it, and that seems to be the pinnacle of what you can achieve. And so having gone over and raced it myself, uh, it, it was really exciting for me to actually make boats that I could paddle a boat that I designed myself across the channel. So, so tell me then, just before we leave that thought that you've just left everyone with, what is it about Hawaii? I've heard Greg Barton's, uh, uh, Greg Grant Kenny, sorry, say it was a, it's a like a mystique, the channel, and Dean Gardner has often tried to displace the thought that, um, that I've heard him say once that the channel sometimes actually gets to pick who it chooses to win out of the top guys. It's not like you can sometimes paddle the race of your life and it may not end up helping you win the actual event. It's not just fitness, it's not just surf skills, but it requires a massive combination of things. What is it that's so elusive about Hawaii that makes all us paddlers that have been to the top of our fields in different areas want to do that race and keep coming back? It is. I think, as Dean said, that you can never predict 100% at the start of the race who's going to win because there's so many different factors that come into play. First of all is the distance of the race. It's a very long crossing. Most of the races that people are doing are shorter. And if, if they don't have the time and the ski and, and, and the confidence to know that they can continue for three and a half or, or some years even four hours uh, to the finish, the fatigue definitely plays into it. Uh, the surf conditions change. Uh, off the start, they're, they're fairly regular. As you start approaching the, the finish there off of Makapu, you'll, you'll get a refracting waves and it becomes very confusing. 
And the currents can also play uh, a big part of it, just your choice of course, depending on which way the tides and currents are going. If you choose a, a more northerly or more southerly or, or more straight line course, it could end up having a huge difference uh, when you come together at the end. So I don't know how you feel before the race then. So taking all that into consideration, it, it creates quite a mental and physical challenge. There's, there, there's no doubt about that for everybody, no matter where you come, whether it's three and a half hours or six hours. But there's something about the race that I've spoken to Oscar about this in the past and Grant Kenny and Martin Kenny, who's done the race nearly 20 years in a row. It has a level of excitement that very few other paddling events actually give you. It's, it's, it's not that long in a day, but it's still a long enough way that really knocks you around physically. But it seems to have this massive lure and attention to excitement with each paddler that has done it that wants to continue to do it. And why do you think that is in that particular race? I think another thing is that you're actually doing a crossing and you're going from one island to another and, and mid-channel you could be uh, 20k or more from shore either direction so you're really truly out in the open ocean and uh, just this challenge of, of being able to negotiate those and choose your own course makes it uh, different than pretty much any other event in the world. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That, that probably certainly uh, sums up why it is such a special race. Um, just jumping back to the epic craft again. So now Epic are distributing boats, of course, to probably every continent in the world. I'm sure I see them everywhere I go in my travels, as I'm certainly uh, catching up with lots of people, developing people technically and also performance-wise. Why do you think it is? What do you believe is the secret of Epic Craft without giving away all your secrets? But why do you believe um, Epic is, has become so successful amongst the paddling community worldwide? The, the big success that we have, I, I think, is blending the science and the technical aspects of it with uh, practical knowledge of, of ocean paddling. And I, I have an engineering background, mechanical engineer by trade. And so when I'm designing a new boat, I'll uh, draw it up in CAD and analyze the stability, uh, rocker profiles, resistance, do some resistance calculations. And then from there, I really count on Oscar and, and our team paddlers like you to give advice of the art part of it. What, uh, it's one thing to, to make a, a ski that, that looks fast on paper, but then to make something that actually is going to handle well and, and that they're going to feel comfortable paddling. So trying to blend those two together. And I, I think between uh, my technical background and the, the skill of the epic paddlers out there, I, I think we make a great team and it'd be hard to match that any place in the world. So, um, just uh, briefly, as you said, your, your background is through mechanical engineering. Um, I know when we were racing against each other, you had a fairly close relationship with Van Dusen, Ted Van Dusen, who built a lot of the Van Dusen boats. Um, has Ted had anything to do with the creation of the Epic product with you? He hasn't had anything to do directly. Well, he did. He has. I thought that either the skis, he hasn't had anything directly, but we did uh, work together and created a line of ICF uh, sprint kayaks. Right. So we worked uh, together on those. I've always uh, enjoyed uh, paddling his boats. He's a very talented designer. And in the process of, of paddling his boats and then working with him to design our boats over the years, uh, some of his knowledge and expertise has rubbed off on me. And so that, that's helped to, to make me a better designer. Right. Fantastic. Um, so within the Epic mold on the way that uh, Epic's moving forward, there's another fellow that's involved in a lot of the key decisions with yourself and Oscar, and uh, that's Charles, isn't it, who's actually a, a partner in, in the business with yourself and Oscar? Yeah, yeah, Charles Brand is a third partner in our business, and he uh, provides uh, financial backing and also a lot of common sense. Um, I've got the <laughs> test technical part. Oscar, has uh, he's always enthusiastic about everything and has big dreams, uh, but sometimes it takes Charles to uh, keep us grounded and, and make sure we're doing things that, that make good business sense and allow our company to, to stay in business uh, long term as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, any company, of course, the balance of any company usually dictates the future of um, its success because not everyone's going to go through um, upward times all, the, all, all every year in each new design that they come up with. But the thing that's quite interesting about what you're currently doing with the Epic Boats is apart from all the small tweaks you're making within the equipment and the attachments and all the anti-corrosive measures to try and make the boats last longer and stay, you know, more, I suppose, visually friendly and usable, um, the design concept with the seat shapes that you've got 
and keeping everything refined yet stable seems to be a real art that you've worked hard on and got, got working very well. Yeah, and we a couple of years ago, we, we got together and, and decided we were going to revamp our entire line. And at that point, we plotted out exactly what type of paddler might be looking for what features in the boat. And that's where we, we came out with a V8 at that point. And that was a, a paddle that would appeal to uh, both beginners and intermediate level paddlers. It was something that, that most people could get into and, and feel comfortable with a very quick learning curve. And then from there, we wanted several steps along the way so that matter where you were in the spectrum from beginner to world-class uh, world champion there would be a boat that, that fit your style of paddling so we went from the v8 to the v10 sport to the v10 and, and then the v12 and now the v14 okay and just very briefly on the v10 because of course it was um you know i asked oscar only recently in an interview that we did with oscar and just asked him what the v and 10 actually meant and uh, he of course said it was the version 10 of the or the, the 10th version of boat that you designed that eventually be, be, became the craft and he I think he said something along the lines it was also like the 10th victory at that time he was going for in Hawaii is that completely correct yeah yeah it is we were at that we we're working with uh, John Dixon who's another fellow engineer and he was helping us uh, with the design helping to, to crunch some numbers do some resistance calculations for us and so uh, we'd put our heads together and say, okay, let's try this. And he'd come, we'd, he'd come back with some ideas and we'd, we'd look at it and we'd say, no, that needs to be faster. So then version two and, and I think about version seven actually became the fastest. Uh, but then we realized that this, we were giving up a lot in terms of stability. So we said, okay, now let's, let's uh, tweak it back a little bit and make it more stable. And then it took a few more generations after that to find what we thought was the optimal balance between stability and speed, and, and that was the 10th version. And then uh, once we did that, we said, well, well what are we going to call it? And uh, as we were passing around computer files and, and renderings and calculations to each other, it always have a v, V1, V2 as, as each version. And uh, John Dixon said, well, well, this is the 10th one, and I know Oscar's won 10 Molokai, so why don't we call it the V10? And, and that name stuck. Yeah, okay, perfect, perfect. So. I'm mindful of your time because, uh, as uh, as you know, we're aware you're in China at the moment doing more work with the Epic products. So, um, what is in store for the paddling community um, looking forward with Epic? Okay, well, we have a, a new version of the V10L, which has just been launched, and I know we're, we're actually loading a container here on Saturday that's going to have a couple of them headed towards Australia. And it'll actually be a, a couple of months before we, we get the large numbers of them into your market. And so that's been launched worldwide. It's just starting to make its way into uh, different markets of the world. And we, we've got a number of other things that are on our, on our list of, of either uh, small improvements or, or even construction changes down the road. It's, it's hard to say exactly when those will hit. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll try try something and it fails, and we'll try something else, and, and sometimes it's two or three years before we actually hit uh, on and accomplish what we're trying to do. So um, for right now, it's the V10L, and, and we do have a lot of ideas in our heads, and it's just a matter of, of when those uh, come to fruition. Okay, all right, fantastic. And just two very short answer questions before you go. Um, your greatest paddling experience, the thing that when you're an old man sitting on your porch or inside your lounge room and uh, you're having a quiet moment, what's the thing you think you'll cherish most of your paddling career? I think the, the, the well, first of all, I think it's all, all the people that I've met from around the world. It's, uh, in, in America, kayaking is a very small sport and you don't get a lot of uh, publicity from it. You're, you're not on the, on the news all the time like the, the football or basketball players. Uh, but just the, being able to travel the world and meet uh, so many high-caliber athletes and, and the respect, that the, the friendships we've made and the respect that we have for each other, uh, you know, that's probably number one that I'll remember. And uh, number two would, would probably be the, the 1987 World Championships, and that was when I won the 1,000-meter K1 by three seconds, and the following day won the 10K by almost a minute. And, and still to this day, I, I'm trying to figure out wh why I peaked perfectly at, uh, at the day of that race. Uh, when you're training for a big event, uh, you're trying to reach your, 
your very best performance on the actual day of the event, and, and oftentimes you're a little bit off, and, and hopefully that's good enough. But uh, on that weekend, uh, it seemed like everything was uh, working perfectly for me, and, and that's that's the goal is to get on the water and just feel like like uh, you're perfectly efficient and that every ounce of energy you put into the stroke uh, causes the boat to accelerate underneath you. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. It was a special year. I, I wasn't there, of course. I was too young at that time to compete, but I was still a, um, a first-year junior when you were doing that. But I saw um, vision, very, very average vision, mind you, of that uh, particular 1,000-metre race and some sections of that 10K. And, uh, yeah, very impressive, mate. It certainly uh, made everyone around the world sit up and think, my God, what's happening in America when you, when you did that to them? That's for sure. But um, just uh, very briefly, the best piece of advice you've ever been given as a paddler. I think the best piece of advice I, I could give to anybody is, is just uh, stick with it. I mean, you're going to have uh, difficulties along the way, and there's going to be ups and downs, but if you're dedicated and, and, and willing to put the time and effort into it, you really can accomplish a lot. So I would say, uh, you know, decide what you want to do, uh, get some good advice from, from fellow paddlers and coaches, and then just go out and do it, and, and most importantly, have fun with it, because if it's not fun, you're not going to continue with it. and You can really see... Um, the people that, that truly enjoy paddling, they make it a lifetime sport. And, and even after they're done competing at the highest level, they're still involved in one way or another. Yes, yes, I agree. Perfect. And one final question. Who do you think has been the most inspirational paddler to you in your career that you either grew up underneath or watched them come along or you now look at them? Or who would that person be for you? Yeah, there's, there's been so many of them. I mean, obviously, the, the first one was uh, Marcia Jones Smoke because she she was somebody I, I knew at a young age, and, and she'd won an Olympic medal, so she was probably my, my biggest inspiration. And I remember then growing up and, and going to Europe and seeing uh, seeing the huge uh, these huge Eastern Bloc paddlers, uh, Rudiger Helm and, and Vladimir Parfenovic. Uh, certainly, they were... Um, you know, incredible and dominated the, the sport for a number of years there, and and later on, uh, you know, it's probably Clint Robinson or yourself, Clint Robinson. Uh, I think the the um, 92 race that we had was, uh, I feel, is one of the most exciting races of all time. Uh, and and Knut Holman, you know, he's probably, um, if you had to, to to pick one person that has been uh, truly dominant in the sport, it would probably be uh, Knut, because he's. Uh, He's won, I don't even know how many goals, but uh, certainly a lot of them against uh, very high-level competition. Yeah, he did. Um, and there's, you know, those names that you mentioned, like I was a little bit young, as I said, but I've seen videos of the Pavonovichs and Rudiger Helms. And while there was always a lot of speculation about was there any sort of substance helping some of those people in the sports, no one will ever truly know. But they were certainly inspirational paddlers to watch on the water with the power and the delivery of their performance, that's for sure. But, um, Greg, look, I understand you've got to go because uh, Epic needs to keep moving and you're one of those people that have to move the company. So um, thank you very, very much for your time and uh, we'll certainly get this out to our listeners in the very near future and I'm sure a lot of people will um, understand a lot more not only about the product but the people design uh, behind it, designing the, what they get to enjoy to paddle. So thank you again and I uh, look forward to chatting to you shortly. All right. Good talking to you, Clint, and uh, look forward to catching up some more. No trouble. Thank you.